All right, here we are in the uh, Gospel of John. Open your Bibles to chapter number two. That's where we're at this morning. This is lesson number five of this particular series. All right, in our last lesson we uh, studied the passage that contained Jesus' first miracle, the changing of the water into wine at the wedding in the northern city of Canaan, Cana. Now after his baptism, Jesus returns to his home area and displays a sign of his miraculous power, but to a very small number of people at the wedding, mainly his family and disciples. And this event is part of the first strand of narrative where John describes you know, Jesus the God-man. So he's going to talk about I remember the overall theme of our study is Jesus the God-man and the, the various strands uh, of narrative that go through this uh, particular book. One strand being Jesus demonstrating that He is the God-man through His miracles and so on and so forth. Another strand of narrative is uh, people responding to Him uh, with faith and how that happened. And then the third strand of narrative is people responding with disbelief and how that happened. And I've explained to you uh, several times how John kind of interweaves these three narratives together uh, in his uh, gospel. Now in the next section, he continues with his, this strand demonstrating not in a miraculous act, but rather in an act of zeal and authority, Jesus' divine power. So the next scene is described as the cleansing of the temple. So now that Jesus has taken a first step into public ministry at Cana, he's going to go to Jerusalem for a very public and dynamic demonstration, not of a miracle, but of his zeal and his authority. So we go to John chapter two, verses 13 and 14. It says, the Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their, uh, seated at their tables. So even though Jerusalem is south of Galilee, a person was said to go up to Jerusalem, which was the holy, no matter which direction you were, you always went up to uh, Jerusalem. And so Jews from everywhere gathered in Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. Now we know that the, the temple's center um, housed the Holy of Holies where only the high priest could enter on a yearly basis. This, uh, this building was uh, segregated by a series of walls and courts which separated the priests from the people, the men from the women, and the Jews from the Gentiles. That was the reason for all of these various courts. And so the court of the Gentiles was symbolically the entrance court. It was the first court that you came to when you entered the temple area. And this is where all nations could gather and pray together to the God of all nations. It was the largest of the courts it was separated from the courts where only the Jews could go, and then these were separated from the places where the priests could go. The uh, porticos, when it talks about Solomon's portico, they were great columns, columnads. Jesus taught in this area. Many others gathered there for teaching. They didn't have classrooms because uh, a meeting, it became a meeting place for early, early Christians. The royal porch of Herod, which was the south side, where Jesus sat among the doctors of law. This is the area where Jesus was when they found Him when He was 12. Luke chapter 2, verse 46. These are renditions of it, obviously no pictures, but people from the scriptural descriptions have put together models to scale. Very interesting, I saw those when I was there in Jerusalem. The temple area, all of the temple area was considered holy, but it increased in holiness as you approach the center area where the Holy of Holies was situated. So you see there on, you know, to the left and right of those buildings, that, that was the, the court of the Gentiles. And then there was, a, there was a thing there, a wall, I'll show you in a minute, that allowed 
men to go in, or women and then men and so on and so forth. Um, the gates, various gates. Um, there were eight entrances into the temple area, each with their own significance. This was the pilgrim gate. The pilgrim gate led to the court of the Gentiles, as I mentioned, for those visiting. Um, interesting, the pilgrim gates had a large pool of water where pilgrims washed before entering the temple area. Uh, the pool, it was called the pool of Siloam. What was interesting, um, there was a pilgrim road which led from the pool of Siloam all the way to the temple area. It was like a, you know, a road that led from one area to the other, to the, actually all the way to the steps that led to the uh, pilgrim entrance. This is where uh, Peter preached his first sermon, Acts 2.38, I'll go back. There, these gates here, these were the pilgrim gates. This is where you know, pilgrims would come from all over the world to, um, to worship. This is where Peter preached his sermon, okay? Um, people were baptized. The, you know, they said, what do they have to do? Go all the way to the river? Well, no, there, was, there, were many, there were pools of water there for the pilgrims to wash before they would go into the, uh, into the holy city. Uh, Josephus, uh, the Jewish historian, claims that one to four million pilgrims each year visited uh, Jerusalem. Um, I'm showing you this, another diagram of the temple to show you the eastern gate. If you notice, uh, it mentions the, uh, the, golden, the golden gate right there. That golden gate was also called the eastern gate. It was the main entrance to the temple area. It was the approach through uh, the Mount of Olives and uh, facing the Garden of Gethsemane across the small Kidron Valley. So, uh, if you were to go you know, this way, up here was the, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, and then you would go down into the Kidron Valley and go back up again and enter into the temple through this uh, Golden Gate, uh, or Eastern Gate. According to Jewish tradition, the Messiah was supposed to enter through this gate. So we read uh, Zechariah chapter nine, says rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you, he is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so that passage is referring to Jesus' triumphal entry. In Ezekiel chapter uh, 44, verses one to three, it says, then he brought me back by way of the outer gate of the sanctuary which faces the east. So this is in one of Ezekiel's visions. That gate I'm talking, the eastern gate, right? Watch what he says in his vision now. He says, and it was shut. The Lord said to me, this gate shall be shut. It shall not be opened and no one shall enter by it. For the Lord God of Israel has entered by it. Therefore it shall be shut. As for the prince, he shall sit in it as prince to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by way of the porch of the gate and shall go out by the same way. And so Ezekiel is talking about this eastern gate and he's saying the Messiah is going to come through this gate. But then he in his prophecy says, but that gate will be shut. Now that's that gate today. That gate today is shut. It's been cemented up, bricked up. Interestingly, when the Muslims conquered Jerusalem in 1530 AD, they blocked up this gate with stones and they planted a cemetery in front of it as their way of preventing the Jewish Messiah from entering in, you know, thinking that no Jew would step on a foreign cemetery because it was unclean. In their mind, oh, the Messiah will never be able to come now because they've blocked the eastern gate that he's supposed to come through and if he's a Jew, a Jewish Messiah, he'd never step over the grave of a foreign power. Little did they know that the Messiah had already come. You know. But anyways, little, little brickwork that was too late in coming. So this part of Jerusalem is still controlled by Muslims. The gate is still blocked, the cemetery is still there, and a mosque stands where the Holy of Holy, 
uh, oh, sorry, I'll show you that later, where the Holy of Holy um, used to be. So where the Holy of Holies used to be, now there's a mosque that stands uh, exactly on that spot. All right, so back to historical temple. This is Herod's temple, by the way, not Solomon's temple. The Solomon's temple was destroyed and then rebuilt again uh, in the time of, uh, of Herod. So uh, there were the courts. This was the woman's court in the foreground, you see there before the steps. Women could not mix with men in the temple area and had their own area, uh, but they could go no further in. It was in this court that the court treasury was, 12 trumpet-shaped containers for voluntary offerings. Uh, Jesus was sitting opposite the treasury when he saw the widow put in the uh, two coins, or only two coins. She was in the court of women. The court of Israel was a smaller place. Once you left the court of women, you walked up the steps there, and that was the court of Israel. This was the place where Jewish men gathered who were neither priests nor Levites. This is where the Jewish laymen gathered for prayer and so on and so forth. The court of the priests, I've got different models I'm showing you. The court of the priests is not in the foreground, that's the court of the women. Go you know, one step through those golden doors there, you had the court of the priests. Only priests could enter here. In this area was the altar of burnt offering where animal sacrifices were made. The altar 45 feet long, 22 feet high. This is, in other words, steps up where the priest would uh, offer. And then once you got beyond you know, the door, that final door against the back wall there, that was the holy place, three areas in the holy place. There was the porch, an entranceway with gold covered the back wall and a golden lamp hung. There were two tables there uh, out of gold and marble, held the showbread, which was eaten only by the priests. Uh, there was also a veil at the entrance. Then there was the hall. In the hall stood the golden altar, golden table, the frankincense cups, the golden lampstead, and here is where priests offered incense. Uh, and then there was the veil, a double veil separated the Holy of Holies from the hall. Only the high priest could access the Holy of Holies only once per year on the Day of Atonement. The Holy of Holies, the internal, you know, that, that internal place there, had no furnishings. It was actually empty in Herod's temple. There was nothing in there. When the priest would go in, he would simply offer prayer. What it originally contained uh, was the uh, uh, Ark of the Covenant, originally back in Solomon's time. Uh, the tablet and the Ark of the Covenant had the tablets of the Ten Commandments, a jar of manna, uh, Aaron's rod. Uh, within the Ark of the Covenant was, uh, of course we know the Ark of the Covenant was destroyed when the Babylonians destroyed Solomon's temple, 587 BC. Then with time eventually the temple began to be rebuilt and Herod, uh, during Herod's time, uh, a lot of that construction was finished. So I want to go back, so that's kind of a little bit, a few pictures about how the temple area, you know, some of the geography, the lay of the land of that. So I want to go back to the court of the Gentiles, because it says that Jesus cleansed the temple. Now the court of the Gentiles uh, represented the place where Gentiles, converts to Judaism, as well as Gentiles, could enter here, but they could go no further under penalty of death. The Jews could not execute the death penalty under Roman law, except in this case for this particular violation. So here's another picture here. You see the arrows point to certain signs that were there on that low wall before someone left the uh, area of the Gentiles, and that, those signs you know, warned people, you know, if you're a Gentile, don't go past this area, because if you do, it's under the penalty of death. They were, they were serious. So this is what Paul the Apostles was nearly killed over in Acts chapter 21, verses 27 to 32. He was accused of willfully bringing a Gentile across that barrier into the part where only the Jews could go. So this is where the money changers were. That's my whole point. 
They were in this area. They were in the court of the Gentiles. They had set up shop um, and uh, Jesus came to uh, run them out of there and I'll explain some of the background of that, why. Just to finish off a little bit of the description, uh, description of the temple area, there was also a place called the uh, Antonia Fortress, that's a, like a garrison where the soldier, Roman soldiers were as part of the uh, temple uh, complex. Uh, it was named after Herod's friend, Mark Antony, housed the garrison of about 600 soldiers, 600 Roman soldiers, and there was an underground passageway that connected the garrison to the court of the Gentiles. So they didn't, they didn't have to run through any of the other areas. They could go underground and come up in the court of the Gentiles, because if there's going to be trouble, that usually was the spot where it would be. So the Romans had abolished the role of king in Israel and allowed the high priest to continue by appointment and approval of Roman leadership. As a matter of fact, I think I mentioned this before, the high priesthood was often sold. You know, different families were competing and it was sold. You know, Rome would sell it because it was a quasi-political uh, role, leadership role. Uh, and the way that they did this was very interesting. The Romans kept the robes of the high priest under lock and key. It, the robes were not under Jewish control, they were under Roman control and they were permitted usage only on special holidays. And so even though Rome permitted the appointment of a high priest, they controlled just how much visibility that high priest would have, because obviously the high priest couldn't appear in public without the special uh, clothing. So that's how they controlled his PR, uh, his PR push. So the temple tax was collected before Passover from everyone 20 years and over, and those coming from afar had to have money exchanged into shekels, and also they had to purchase animals for sacrifice during the Passover. You know, if you're coming from 200 miles away, you're not going to bring a couple of sheep with you, and you had money and uh, you had currency from your own country. And so it's like today, you land at the airport you know, in Germany or something, you go to the money, exchange place and you change your American dollars for whatever they are, euro, I guess the euro now. You know what I'm saying? So same idea, they come from afar, they need to buy animals, they need to exchange their money, so on and so forth. Well, you know, the money changers, the animal sellers, so on and so forth, took up space uh, in the court of the Gentiles. Now originally this commerce had taken place outside the temple walls, but with time, the merchants had been allowed to set up in the court of the Gentiles. This, the importance of this uh, 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 speaks to why Jesus went in to cleanse the temple. By allowing the merchants to come into the court of the Gentiles, this rendered the area designated for the Gentiles unclean and therefore useless as a place of worship for them. It's the only place in the temple area that Gentile converts and Gentiles could come to worship God. Only place they were allowed to go. And by bringing in animals and money changers, they defiled that area and rendered their prayers, in their own mind anyways, useless. So even though uh, it was the court of the Gentiles, it was still part of the temple, and defiling that place defiled all of it, not to mention the hypocrisy and the prejudice that this um, represented. You know, the money changers paid a portion of their profits to the priests in order to secure their position within the temple walls, within the area of the temple. So it was a money thing. You know, could you imagine although we don't consider our auditorium, quote, a holy place, but could you imagine if we set up a, you know, a flea market in there during services, you know, out in the back? I mean, you know, people, uh, we even discourage you know, uh, kids selling chocolate and for school and that, we kind of tell them, you know, how about wait until after services, maybe do that out in the foyer, you know, we don't, we don't, you know, we don't, we don't like the idea of commerce taking place exactly in the place where we offer our worship uh, to God. So for them it was even, it, it, it was even worse in that, uh, in that context. 
So there's a little bit of background about the temple and its area and some of the reasons why Jesus did what He did. In John chapter 2 verse 15 it says, and He made a scourge of cords, drove them all out of the temple. So, that's, so when He's saying the temple, He's not talking about the Holy of Holy. For, for the Jews, everything was the temple, even the court of the Gentiles. Okay. So He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and He poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, He said, take these things away, stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So Jesus forces these merchants and their goods out. You know, people often see Jesus as the friend of children, uh, the suffering savior, but in this scene we see him demonstrating not only his righteous anger in defending what, what, what is proper, but also we see his physical power. He was angry and you know, they didn't want to mess with him. You know? he, was, he was taking them out. No one stood in his way. So here he is, 30 years old, with a couple of decades, working as a carpenter, a stonemason. That meant he was no physical weakling. Yeah, it's a lot of scholars, you know, they, 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 they're not in agreement with the idea that he was a carpenter, like a wood carpenter, because there wasn't that much wood in that area. A lot of things were made out of stone. I thought maybe he was a mason, a stonemason. Anyways, they quibble over those type of things. Uh, Jesus was not afraid of removing those elements that was spoiling the purity of the temple. So in this scene we say Jesus show his humanity. Remember, you know, one strand of the narrative is Jesus the God-man. So here the emphasis is on man, the man side of God-man. So we see him show his humanity as his religious zeal moved him to a righteous indignation and anger towards those who were in the wrong. And this was a very human reaction to injustice, right? I mean, we see that even as parents, the older, the older child takes advantage of the younger child. I remember at Halloween, you know, the kids would go out and get candy and you know, money. And I remember one scene where, where our eldest was, talk, was negotiating with our youngest and he was saying, now you don't want those little tiny dimes, you want these big nickels, you see, they're a lot bigger than the dimes, so if you give me all your dimes, I'll give you all these precious nickels, you know? And I overheard that and I was indignant at the injustice, the injustice that was taking place uh, between uh, uh, our two sons. So you know, uh, being indignant is, is, a, is a, a, human, uh, a human reaction that we have to injust, and a lot of times, we need that emotion to move us to some sort of action, don't we? To take, to, take, uh, to take action against something which is unjust and not right. So Jesus, we see that, we see that part of Him. So, um, so after Jesus' cleansing of the temple area, the Jewish leaders, they don't arrest Him. Instead, they ask to see if He, if he has any sign to confirm that He has a right to do this. After all, he might be a prophet. You know, it says the Jews then said to him, what sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it took 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this rather, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus, had, uh, which Jesus had spoken. So Jesus knows their hearts. He knows what's going on inside of them. They don't really want to believe. For people who don't want to believe, no amount of proof is enough. So remember, I keep going with the three strands. What have we just seen here, just in this short passage? The Jewish, he does something that demonstrates something about the God-man, and then the reaction of the Jewish priests and the leaders. Belief or disbelief? Well, disbelief, right? So Jesus reveals in a veiled manner the sign that will furnish undeniable proof of his um, identity. However, in the end, it'll be the proof that will convict them of their disbelief. 
If you're believing and then receive proof, it confirms your belief. But if you're disbelieving all along and the proof comes out, it's a proof that you were wrong in disbelieving. He will ultimately die because of their rejection and their disbelief, the cause. His resurrection, however, will become not only the proof of His legitimate claim as the Messiah, it'll also be the proof that their disbelief was wrong. Now, of course, the prophecy made here about the destruction of His body and its resurrection, as well as the destruction of the city and the temple, both were fulfilled, right? So first, through his death, burial, and resurrection, only three years later, his prophecy about you know, destroy this temple, in three days it'll be raised. And also in 70 AD, the Roman army laid siege to the city and eventually killed most of the inhabitants and then literally took the city apart stone by stone. Josephus, the Jewish historian, estimates that over a million people were killed during the, the 70 AD sage, siege. Rather. That was just one battle, eh? that was, we're talking over a year, I think 18 months they laid, laid siege to the city of Jerusalem. <clears throat> people died of starvation, they killed each other, and then finally when they went in they just wiped them all out. So if you travel by the, uh, by the city today, Jerusalem, you can still see the huge stones in a rubble at the base of the walls built by the Crusaders. The original stones of Herod's temple are still in rubble. They've left them there. Now they're like a tourist attraction, but they're very real. Um, they burned what they could burn. They carried off what precious metal and cloth that they could find. They disassembled the walls. They disassembled the temple. They also, uh, this is significant, they also destroyed the genealogical records that were stored in the temple area by which the Jews could trace their original lines. Which tribe they belonged to? Why was that important? Yes, you had to be able to trace your lineage back to the a particular tribe, the tribe of Levi. You had to be able to trace your lineage in order to establish your credentials to serve as a priest of any kind. So this was a death blow because without the records there was no way to know for sure what land was your land or determine who could serve as priest even if tomorrow you know, the temple area that stands today was destroyed and you know, it, was, it all became rubble and uh, all the Jewish people all over the world put their money together and rebuilt the temple and they did it to scale with gold and even if they did that, what, what would they be missing? Well, they'd be missing priests <laughs> to offer the sack, even if they wanted to do that. They'd be missing the priests because no one could claim um, um, to be a priest according to their, uh, according to their uh, laws. Uh, today, there it is, that's the thing I wanted to show you. Today a mosque stands on the spot where the temple and the Holy of Holies once stood and it's called the Dome of the, uh, the, Dome of the Rock. Now the Jews still believe that one day the temple and the Holy of Holies will be rebuilt. As a matter of fact, they pray for this at the Wailing Wall, which is the western wall, uh, the only remaining section of wall from that time. It's about 100 yards from the spot where the Holy of Holies once stood. So 100 yards from where the Holy of Holies once stood now remains a portion, the western wall. Uh, remains, just, just a portion of that wall. And in that wall, they, you know, between the mortar, a lot of holes, you know, the mortar's been worn out and so on and so forth, and what they do is they write their prayers down and they, you're right, they roll them up in a little scroll and they put them into the little crevices and cracks and so on and so forth into the, into the wailing wall. And of course they have a crew that comes in after a while and takes those out and makes room you know, for new, just like in the Catholic Church, you, know, you light a candle for your prayer, so on and so forth. Well at night somebody comes along and blows all those candles out, puts in new candles, otherwise they would exhaust the supply. Same, same idea. 
I remember when I was there many years ago, I asked our, our guide, Ibrahim, I said, you know, I said, uh, so what tribe are you from? And he says, oh, I'm, I'm from the tribe of Judah. I said, really? How do you know? He said, oh, oral tradition. <laughs> I, oh, okay. I said, I'm from the tribe of Judah too. How do you know? I'm an oral tradition. You know. I mean, your word's as good as mine. And so in John chapter 2, 23 to 25, John writes, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. Whoops, there's that other strand, right? Some disbelieved, the priests, you know, some believed. But Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. So John mentions, but does not describe the miracles that Jesus does during this time. So he did miracles, we don't know which ones they are. Now a lot of people believe because of the set miracles, but they were not ready to receive his teaching. They were convinced that he was special, but Jesus did not want them, uh, he didn't want to become their leader because he knew that their hearts were not yet turned to God and ready to accept what he was sent to do. Because we see, you know, one minute they're believing, next minute they're ready to, to kill him, they're ready to condemn him. I want you to note that two strands are evident here. Uh, Jesus, uh, three strands, all of them, just in what we've done today. Jesus demonstrating his God-man person, the man part especially, zealous, fulfilling scripture. He shows his God-man, the God side, it says he did many miracles. We see the strand of disbelief, the priests question him, basically saying, who do you think you are? What authority do you have to do this? Imagine witnessing a miracle and then saying to him, who do you think you are? I mean, how strong is that kind of disbelief? And then we see also the belief side, where many were beginning uh, to, believe, uh, to believe in Him. All right, well, we'll stop there um, for uh, this week. We, we start a brand new section next time. We won't have time to do that this time. So we'll stop right here for this particular uh, lesson. <coughs>